Okay, so after completing two introductions to this study, Arrival with Consequences, we can go ahead and start part one of this. And we'll go over a little bit more of the word parousia, the second coming of Jesus Christ, also known as the parousia. And 17 times it shows up in Scripture. Parousia is an arrival with a consequential presence. Now there's one passage, and we'll come back to this later on down the road in this study. But there's one passage here. If you turn in your Bible here, and we'll get a handle on it. There's a passage in John that does not use the word parousia when it discusses the word parousia, or second coming. But it does define for us the lexical meaning of the word parousia, which is an arrival with a consequential presence. So if you're able, turn to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Christ is talking to the fellows here. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Now listen now. I go to prepare a place for you. So Christ hasn't gone to the cross at this point yet. But he's going to get to that cross. He's going to be raised from the dead and 40 days later. What's he going to do? He's going to ascend. So I go to prepare a place for you. Yes? I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now, do you all have any problem with the I will come again to be in reference to the second coming? Verse 3 says, I will come again. And Jesus is speaking to the apostles here. He's coming again to receive them to himself. And I wonder if there are other passages that speak about Christ coming back and receiving believers unto himself. It's familiar language in the New Testament. And I think we can find a few. But just in case these first three verses in John 14 aren't registering, let me just ask you to hear me out real quick and we'll move on. Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now it's talking about parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. Now at the bottom of verse 3, that where I am, there you may be also. Now if you read that very carefully, you ought to be able to see that if he comes back, as in this reference to the second coming, and he says, I receive you unto myself, of course people want to say that's the rapture. And we'll get to that. It's not the topic of discussion just yet, but I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, stop. Well, if Christ is saying here, to the apostles, then where is he at? Where is Christ at? He is here, isn't he? Yeah, he's here. If I come again and receive you unto myself, 
that where I am here, you may be also. Where? Here. He's here. That's parousia, folks. That's an arrival with a consequential presence, you see. So for anyone that believes Scripture states that the second coming entails Jesus coming down, collecting up church members from out of their cubicles in the workplace and taking his church in the blink of an eye up and out of the driver's seats of planes, trains, and automobiles in some kind of rapture and taking them back to heaven for seven years while hell is unleashed down here in the world, that's the dispensational view. That rapture dispensational view is the newest, youngest view on the block, by the way, when it comes to the historical views of interpreting Scripture relative to this second coming. But if it's a problem with those who endorse this view, this verse, these verses are a problem for them. This passage really rattles their cage because this is the only view they were taught, and it's the only view they know, and it's a major malfunction of interpretation. This John 14, 1 through 3 passage doesn't work for that rapture theory, that presuppositional rapture interpretation. It just doesn't work for that. It doesn't work for Jesus coming down, collecting you up, and leaving. This isn't a, a holy vanishing moment or such. Jesus isn't coming down in any manner of the such. <clears throat> in this passage in John 14, 1 through 3, it teaches the essential meaning of parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. Now, what we can move along with now are some other passages that deal with the word parousia. Now, I'm using the New American Standard Bible in this study. And as we go through these passages, we'll see the word coming or come or cometh. If you have a King James Version, and I really think it would do you some good, you know, to read different types of versions. Um, but in the King James Version, it, it might say cometh. But uh, in, when you come across this word coming, whatever translation you have, write neatly in the margin of your Bible above the word coming or come or cometh, write the word parousia. And maybe write it down in a bookmark, the definition of parousia, an arrival with a consequential presence. So when Jesus comes back and is parousia, he stays. He doesn't go anywhere. Christ is spirit. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent and omnipotent. And many atheists say that that's not possible. Sure it is. Mere man has created Wi-Fi. Christ works in the realm of eternity past, present, and future, right? So does this Wi-Fi. You get on Wi-Fi with your internet, you can dwell in your mind in past, present, or future. So the scripture states, when Christ comes back, he stays. He doesn't go anywhere. And eventually, we'll go thoroughly over all the scriptures that speak about the fact that he stays. And you'll come to the conclusion, most likely all by yourself, that Jesus has been here for the past 2,000 some years. And that means there's been a new heavens and a new earth for the last 2,000 some years. And we'll get to that new heavens and new earth. It'll really be telling for you. It'll really open your eyes. So don't get your feathers all ruffled up. You've got to test this stuff. And be patient. We're going to deal with this and get a handle on all these subjects. It may take 40 weeks. It may take 70 weeks. There's a lot to go over. 
There's a lot to say. And it's of utmost importance to go through these studies following along in your Bible. So do that now as we go over the parousia in Matthew's Gospel. Let's just flip back a couple chapters or a couple books to Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the disciples actually ask Jesus two questions right here, don't they? Now, according to Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse, in Mark 13, there are four of the disciples on the mount with Jesus. There's Peter, James, John, and Andrew. There are four of them. And Christ is speaking directly to them. Right? And it would do you some good to notice that all the places that you see the word yea or you know that Christ is addressing those in his company at that time to whom he's speaking to. It's, it's very important to understand because all throughout the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is saying that it is you guys, it is you fellas, who are going to experience and or see some of these things. Or some of them will see all of these things. It's very important to get a handle on that ye and you. Who is that? <clears throat> in the scripture that he's talking to in that moment. In the context of that moment. A lot of people really take it as, oh, that's to me. That's to us today in 2022. And by the way, particularly, John is going to live all the way past 70 A.D. And Jesus backs that up in John, the 21st chapter, when he prophetically says to Peter, if it is my will for John, who was standing there, if it is my will for him to remain till I come back or until I return, what is that of your business? You just follow me. Now, isn't that interesting right there? And we'll cover this later on. He told John that he would remain until he came back. So that means John is either held up in a cave somewhere, a little aged and a little ripe by now, or Jesus came back during John's lifetime. I tell you, it'd do you some good to think on that. Because that's just what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 27 through 28, that some would be living when he returned. So let's read here in Matthew 23, verses 37, and 39, 37 through 39 of Matthew 23. <clears throat> Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate, for I say to you, from now on, you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord should be very familiar as you've been studying over the years in your Bible. It was said by the people and children, they were crying out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus was coming down from the Mount of Olives, the triumphal entry, riding on the donkey, as Zechariah 9, 9 prophesied. And the people were crying out various portions of Scripture out of Psalm 118. Because that's 
what they did during the Passover. And these were Messianic passages. And one of them was, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the children were even crying out. They were crying that out in the temple when Jesus went into the temple. So now we have in your pocket, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when it says, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. That's not the house of Israel, but the temple. This is all temple language. This is dealing, Matthew 23, with the temple. Let's go to Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. So we just read in Matthew 23, 38, Jesus saying, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And two, first, two verses later on here in Matthew 24, 1, And Jesus came out of the temple, the temple, and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And Christ said to them, in verse 2, I believe it is, yeah, in verse 2, do you not see all these things? And first off, what disciples is Christ speaking to here when he's asking them, do you not see all these things? He's talking to Peter, John, James, and Andrew, right? See, only Mark 13.3 gives us that info, so we're comparing Scripture with Scripture here. And we'll continue to go throughout these coming studies. We'll use the context of who's being talked to in the Scriptures. So th So Christ tells them that your house is being left to you desolate. And let me share with you the significance of that temple then. While when he would say, your house is going to be left to you desolate, that cut them to the core. I'm telling you, that would cut them right to the core because that temple was everything. We're in the transistory period from the old covenant to the new covenant. So the temple practices and ordinances were still being honored. That temple, the house of God, right, was the premier statement, the physical statement about Judaism. And there are historical explanations that talk about the fact that from miles away, if travelers were on their way to Jerusalem, they could actually see that temple from a distance with, with the white, bright, glistening domes and the reflecting gold off of the walls and walkways, the gold-wrapped railings just shining in that desert heat of the sun, just shining away. And when Herod the Great had been rebuilding the temple, and mind you, the only reason for this temple rebuild was to get into the good graces of the Jews. That was Herod's aim there. But the temple was some 38 years being built. And it's just going to be finished a couple years before Nero sends in General Cestus Gallus with the first deployment of the Roman army to begin the earliest infiltration and takeover of Jerusalem in the summer of AD 66. And just a couple or so years after that invasion began, in August of AD 70, well, the temple would be scorched to the ground, being only finished just a few short years. So Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 1, came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up 
to point out the temple buildings to him. So the disciples, disciples are, they're holding a lot of stock in that temple. In all its beauty and glory, its robust structure of stone that would seem to anyone that it would last forever. This temple, this holy place where the God of Judaism dwelled, meaning it was the idol of Judaism. But it will all come down. It will all come down. In Matthew 24, 2, He answered them and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, Not one stone here shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. You see, once the Roman army burned down the temple after breaching the walls, after breaking down the walls of the compound and actually going inside the temple, for many weeks after it was scorched and torched, the army pulled up the various stones and the pavers around the temple. Because of the intense heat of the temple itself burning down, and all that gold in the temple and on the temple melted, and ran down into every crack and cranny. And this was something the Roman soldiers were allowed to do. They would pillage and dig up all that gold that ran down. They could, they could take whatever they wanted. And they were bringing in the mules and the oxen and whatever machinery of the time and removing and, re and prying up these, these huge blocks of stone and some of those stones are still visible today over there in Jerusalem off to the sides of that insignificant wall over there. But in any case, they would pull up all those stones and pavers and this pillaging was literally fulfilling what Jesus says here in verse 2. So let's tie this together now. Let's read Matthew 24 verses 1 and 2. And then we'll go into verse 3. And Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came up to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So it looks as if the fellows are pretty much believing Jesus right about now. That his house is coming down. That this house, this, this temple they hold so close to their heart, the place where God dwells, it's coming down. Now here's something that's important to remember for later on in this study. But the beginning of the context, when we get to the Olivet Discourse, has to do with this temple and this temple being torn down and is directly going to be used by Christ to talk about and point out that when they see this take place, then that's the timing of his coming. Here, I'll give you a little, y'all a little more of a sample here. Let's go to Matthew 24, 29, and 30. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. It doesn't say that the Son of Man would appear 
No, it doesn't say that. But the sign, the sign of the Son of Man would appear in the heavens, which means the atmosphere of the sky, right? Verse 30 again, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. That's exactly what Jesus is going to say in Matthew 26, 64 to the members of the Sanhedrin when he's standing in front of them in his mock trial. And Jesus will say exactly that. I am the Son of Man or the Son of God. And you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And then they rent their robes or, or, and they tore and ripped their robes, accusing Jesus of blaspheming. And why is because the Jewish understanding of the ancient East is that only God comes in the clouds. So they thought Jesus was blaspheming. And when this text says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, it's in light of what he said earlier in verse 30. Context. Got to stay in context. And that would be, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. And I'm going to show, and I'll, and we'll see this together in context of Scripture, that the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, meaning that the sign in context has everything to do everything to do with that temple coming down with that temple being destroyed and Jesus saying not one stone being left standing until it all comes down and then it says well let's just read on Um, let's just read it one more time here Matthew 24 and we'll go all the way to verse 33. Now listen up if you're not reading along in your Bible. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. (coughs) And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know summer is near. So after all this happens, verse 33 says, Even so you too, When you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Now let me ask y'all a question. Would y'all agree with me on this? That this verse 33 here is in reference to the second uh, second coming? Most of you probably would. Christ isn't talking to us right here. Christ is talking to the fellas that they would see all these things. They would see this. They would see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. They would see the destruction of the Old Covenant temple system. They would see the darkened sun, the falling stars, and the lightless moon. Not some later generation of people. Those people, then, the ones Christ was talking to. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And whoever else was around eavesdropping in the crowd then. You see? Can't make that mean something it doesn't. So we'll move on to part two next time. Y'all have a good weekend. Till next time.